Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jesse from the Gardener's Workshop. In today's episode, we're revisiting an interview that Lisa did in October of 2020 on the Flower Podcast with host Scott Shepard. Scott and Lisa covered a broad range of topics, including where cool flowers can be grown and how they can increase your farm's production, finding your niche market in outside the box selling opportunities, understanding how learning via courses saves time and money, creating a business model that suits your lifestyle. And last but not least, Lisa's top five list of warm season annuals. It's a bunch. Here you go. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to the Flower Podcast. I'm Scott Shepard. I'm not sure how well you know me, but my love of flowers and plants led me to pursue my degree in horticulture from the University of Georgia many years ago. I've always been fascinated with the idea that I could plant this little seed or take a cutting from a plant and grow some of the most amazing flowers to enjoy either inside or outside. So even though my career led me into the world of wholesale flowers for florists, I have always been thrilled to work with local farmers besides dabbling in that world a little bit myself. All of this to say that I'm happy to have Lisa Mason Ziegler from the Gardener's Workshop as our guest this week. So if you're a flower farmer or you're interested in growing some flowers for yourself, you're going to love this week's episode. Lisa Mason Ziegler started the Gardener's Workshop and I'm thrilled to share her story. She started growing in 1998 with everything being grown outside without greenhouses or high tunnels. She's been a leader with the Association of Specialty Cut Flowers, also known as ASCFG. She's written several books and now selling many of the products that she uses in her own business through their website. In addition to her own courses, she now helps produce and distribute all kinds of courses to help beginning growers and florists. And I'm really excited to have Lisa this week on the Flower Podcast. Welcome to the Flower Podcast, Lisa. I'm excited you're here today. Hey, thanks, Scott. It is my pleasure to be here. I I have to admit, when I found you on Facebook and started following you a a long time ago, but have recently um, just sort of been tuning into your lives and things, I learned so much from what you offer. Um, It's a tremendous resource. How long have you been doing the lives and just all this education? Well, the education part probably started about 10 years ago, but actually doing lives, the very first live I ever did was for the Cut Flower Association. We decided as an organization, we wanted to do lives. And so I said, okay, I'll be the guinea pig. I'll go first. (laughs) When I did it, I realized how easy it really was. I mean, I was afraid of the tech part of it because, I mean, I love to speak and teach and all that. So... Um, but yeah, once I did it, there has been no looking back. <laughs> That's great. Well, before we, I know we could talk all day because you and I just, we have so many things in common and so many interests in common. Um, but before we do that, I kind of would like to go back. And for those who don't know, kind of hear your story, how you got into growing flowers, why, um, where, did, where did this all begin? So I was, I kind of described myself as I'm a gardener gone wild. I was a home gardener. I did not grow up in a gardening home. Started gardening when I bought my first home as a single person. Started dabbling and then um, I kind of met this wonderful guy and at the same time I discovered the book The Flower Farmer by Len Mm Bozinski and he and I decided to get married and it just so happens he comes he came with tillers a piece of really, (laughs) really, really fertile land in the middle of the city. And he was a big gardener. So literally one thing led to another. And I went from a single girl paying a mortgage to a married person that didn't have to put the bread on the table or the bacon on the table anymore. And I was able to quit my job that I loved. I was the business manager of a very busy animal hospital for about 15 years. And I was able to quit that job and just dive into doing what that book told me to do. I've just piggybacked on tower farming. I mean, flowers and farm and gardening are at the root of everything that I do today, becoming good at it and efficient um, and sharing that message with other people. 
um, from selling the stuff they need to do it with to teaching them through books and courses and speaking. And um, so it's just been great. So I've been doing it since 1998. And my little farm is in the middle of the city. I'm totally an urban farmer. Um, I, when I first started, we only had an acre and a quarter, including where my home sat. And people are so surprised that the first 10 years, I only had a half acre garden and I still produced thousands of stems every week in season. And um, so we've had the opportunity to buy a little piece attached to us, which brought us up to a whopping 2.85, I think it is, acres. <laughs> and, um, and that's kind of where we are. So we've gone full circle. I spent about eight years in what we call full high production, where we sold to 23 florists Gosh, two supermarket chains at farmer's markets, an on-farm mar private market, and a subscription drop-off. And about three years ago, I started to take my foot off of that pedal as we dove into more education. Um, I was just finishing up my second book. And then we dove into online courses, which have been phenomenal. They're just such an amazing way for people to learn. Um, an opportunity. And so here we are today. So now my farm is still that same size, but our actual working gardens, gardens more like three quarters of an acre. And, um, and I'm, I think I'm doing now what people dream of a flower farm and farm being, you know what I mean? It's not so high pressure. When we were producing 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week in high production, that is a lot of people and a lot of work every week week after week, and now it's not like that at all. So we, we gave up our florist, we gave up our supermarkets, and we just cater to our own retail customers that are all private. Um, you know, we don't have a market people can visit um, and grow flowers and do a lot of teaching about how we do all that. So it's really pretty awesome. I am definitely living the dream life career. So right now you're growing flowers still in three quarters of an acre. That's a lot of flowers. And so what are you doing with all those flowers? Yeah, that's a great question. And because people so underestimate the power of a small piece of land to grow flowers, <laughs> we're still producing thousands of stems of flowers a week. And so we'd have, we basically service two groups of retail customers. We have an on-farm private market. I think we have 140 members now. Wow. And um, so there's that. And then we also have a bouquet drop-off service. And we do still service one florist who is our original florist who will just kind of swoop in and take anything we have that, you know, so once a week at the beginning of the week, we connect with him. So, but we use so many of our flowers now for photography and videoing for our courses, our online store for seeds. And we're doing now what we always dreamed to be able to do during those high production years. And you just didn't have time. Right. We're out there ripping our gloves off, trying to fix our hair from hat hair, <laughs> take a picture to use in something significant because there was no time to do that stuff. So now we're just really embracing Racing, all those opportunities that we have. Well, one of the things that I think has stood out to me that I'm really excited about is I know there's different people in different parts of the country that have their courses, that have some courses as well. But the deal with the heat and the humidity of the South or Southeast, um, I don't know of too many that are doing that like you are in this part of the country. And so I know a lot of times people say, well, you can do this there, but you can't do that here, which may be true for a flower too. But overall, I think it's just how do you adapt your situation to, you know, being able to produce that flower. Like I, I think of poppies, for example, that's what comes to mind right off the bat, because, you know, for years and years and years, you know, people were like, well, you can't really grow poppies in the Southeast, but you could grow, like there were some varieties you could grow, but for cut production, like the traditional Oriental poppies and things like that, you know, it was either too hot or they, you know, timing when you plant them. And it's just nice to see, you know, somebody, that's producing information that's helpful to everybody in this part of the world. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so we really try to give the equation for people to apply 
our growing recommendations to any environment. We have people from all over the world. Last year, what comes to mind is we had had a student in South Africa that was in wow. a really crazy situation. And, you know, so while yes, I mean, we are in the Southeast, um, I'm in the mid-Atlantic of the United States, zone 7B slash 8A. Um, in my book, Cool Flowers talks about applying that concept that you were just talking about. When do we, those folks that have warm, hot, humid, and long summers grow those cool season flowers, which we can do. I mean, we now grow bumper crops of poppies and you know the Iceland poppies that are so beautiful as cuts and sweet peas and snapdragons. The point I'm trying to make is that in our courses, we try to give folks the equation to figure out how to apply what we're teaching them to their winter hardiness zone and their growing conditions. That is key um, because it is way different in New England than it is here in Virginia <laughs> or for you down in Georgia. And But we all just have different planting times and the way we handle things. Mm, that's really powerful because you're right, because then they can adapt it anywhere. That's the point. That's, you know, awesome. that's the key. That's the secret sauce. Not just, okay, if you live where I live, this is what I do. Because we get people that ask us that all the time. I want your planting list. I want to know when you're planting this. And it's like, but you're in Michigan. Doesn't apply. You can grow the same stuff I'm growing, but we plant it at different times. And we teach people on well, my course, which is flower farm in school, the basics. Um, that's what we teach them is how to figure out how to do that. And I do think that is so significant. Well, one of the things or challenges that I know um, a lot of flower farmers face is how to um, extend that season or extend the profitability of what they're doing because um, you know just like you just mentioned depending on where you are in the country depends on how long your season is and and how you know once that danger of frost or snow or whatever you know and then the other side when spring starts but i'm just curious you know what are some highlights or tips for people that that are trying to figure out how can they start generating revenue later or earlier than they're used to that's a great question and something i didn't mention when i was telling you a little bit about me is that i also am a 100 percent field grower i have no hoop houses i really oh, wow. can't here in the city and we have made lemonade out of lemons <laughs> there's a lot of ways to do that so for one thing um that book i was just talking about cool flowers that talks about hardy annuals um that increased our profit margin a third because it added a whole nother season of annuals that grow in early spring when it's still cold at night but just warm during the day um, and there's some of the most beloved cut flowers right bells of ireland snapdragon sweet william poppies fever few i mean i could go well there's about 40 of them um, and so that bought us harvest in april may and june in my zone then you throw in, so another one of our courses um, with Dave Dowling is Bulbs, Perennials, and Woodies. It's mixing up and being diverse. You can really produce a good long growing season to produce revenue. Really a little bit before your season, of course, during your season, and then even a little bit afterwards by embracing, we call it growing seasonally. The hardy annuals, which are annuals that love it cool to cold. People have a hard time wrapping their head around that, um, but that allows us to grow earlier and to grow later. And that all together, I mean, we, it has really impacted our, um, our gross for cut flowers. Um, it changed everything. And now that Cool Flowers was published in um, 2014, and I did not make this up. Our grandmas used to do this. You know, they knew they were so in touch with the seasons because they all had a garden out back, right? Right. They, they knew they planted larkspur and sweet peas at Christmas for when, you know, that's a cute little story that somebody was telling, but they knew this. And so I've just rekindled that idea in that book. Um, and it really just holds people's hands and helps them. It's really changed it and particularly for people in very Northern regions 
where it's so cold for so long, it's really changed everything for them to field grow. Now, if you throw a hoop house in or a greenhouse in, you can produce year round. Dave Dowling's course also talks about that. Um, Steve and Gretel Adams are doing growing cut flower crops and hoop and greenhouses. And let me tell you, they have 17 structures and they grow in Ohio. It is going to change people's worlds. Um, wow. and it's just really providing the basics right up to how to really extend what your harvest is and how to do it. Well, you said something and, and I want to make sure I didn't hear that wrong. Um, I get the whole planting like you said, at Christmas time or wherever for that April, um, March, April, May yield. But as far as extending it on the other side of like October, November, December, did I hear that right? Like you can. You can. And that's a little bit more advanced. Um, so that group of flowers, these hardy annuals are very affectionately and flattering to me now called cool flowers. That's what people actually, actually somebody on social media the other day said, I've heard about this cool flower thing and they were talking about it, but nobody ever said it was a book <laughs> actually filtered that uh -huh. now that anyway, the cool season hardy annuals can be manipulated to bloom in the fall. I've had snapdragons and sweet Williams right up to, to um, past Thanksgiving in a good year here out in the field. Um, but that is more advanced. You have to master growing the cool flowers, first successfully and then start manipulating and starting them at the because you have to start them in the dead of summer that's hard for a lot of people to do because of heat um but yes you can do that that is that's a big deal because i didn't realize um i know here we always planted certain things for harvesting in the spring but never realized you could do some of those tricks maybe it's because i'm usually so busy with everything else i'm like i don't want to i don't want to add something else to the plate but well, that's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. So where you are and where I am for cool flowers, we plant 90% of all of them in the fall. Do you plant pansies? Do y'all have pansies? In Georgia? Oh, yeah. Pansies are a hardy annual. You know how you plant them in the fall and then they suffer through winter, but they survive? That's exactly what the rest of them do. And um, that's how we have sweet peas, bells of Ireland. I mean, things that we have been told for years you cannot grow because it's too hot. Um, and you can, it's just the planting time has to be proper for them. So now I know that you said that you field grow everything and you don't have high tunnels, but do you use those low tunnels or the caterpillar tunnels? Do you do that? Um, I do use low tunnels, but we do not make caterpillars. We only use lightweight row cover and it is strictly for deer and wind protection from the, those really? things. Um, and so you don't need them. These, I'm telling you. This group of flowers, many of them are winter hardy to zone six, which is north of me, it means they will take single digits out in the, I mean, I can see the look in your eyes, Josh. <laughs> I mean, it is fascinating, and I've been doing it for 22 years, and it's, you don't have to, we don't fuss over plants here, only the strong survive, and so we strictly use lightweight row covers to keep the deer from trampling our stuff all winter, and to protect the foliage from the wind because it just tatters it. And um, so, no, we don't use any, um, these, that group of flowers, cool flowers, are winter hardy. That's awesome. I, I love that. Well, and I think that's huge that it can increase. And I think I already said this before, but a third, I mean, to increase your production by a third or your dollars by a third, that's, that's huge. That's really And that's huge. the highest demand season, right? I mean, it, you can't have enough. <laughs> No, yeah, absolutely. We have one grower um, that I know of because he does a no-till course for us. They only produce and sell cool flowers pretty much in wow. May, I'm sorry, in March, April, May, and June. And then they shut their production down and um, do other things. I mean, how awesome is that? Yeah, so, yeah the worst time of year really is that heat and uh, you miss all that. That's incredible. I know I've heard of a few other growers who do that sort of manipulating with their schedule. I don't know. I think I would have a hard time with that, but maybe not. Maybe if you make enough money during the that peak time, you figure it out. Well, I feel like one of the topics that um, obviously you've been successful in, in doing since the very beginning of your business is is marketing how to get that those flowers 
cars out there. I know that when we see this huge surge of new growers, people taking courses like what you offer, buying seeds they've never tried before, you know, and I know it's, it's always that old story, which comes first, the, the horse or the cart or the chicken or the egg, you know, and how do you really develop the market or how do you, how do people figure out how to sell their flowers? Sure. And so that is, um, that is a part of what my course is about, about marketing. And um, first I want to say people get so intimidated by the influx on social media, not necessarily out there doing it, um, of people that are trying or attempting um, and maybe just not having all the necessary pieces. Um, part of actually the whole first week's class in my course is all about getting down to the business of what you're doing. And then we talk about marketing and we actually have bonus sessions coming on this year. I mean, you know, COVID changed everything. Sure. A lot of growers who were doing, particularly people that had big farmer's market followings that do these big markets, they had no connections to their customers other than showing up every week. And when there was all of a sudden no market. Um, so we're addressing that how to do it. Um, but I want to say that, you know, and I know that you know this as being a wholesaler, you know, there's like seven to eight billion dollars a year spent on flowers in the United States alone. B as in billion, right? right. That is a lot of flowers. And 80% of that is being imported. So in my opinion, and after doing this for 22 years, there is no ceiling. The, the problem is you have to figure out as a small grower how you can find your niche in the market, whether it's selling to florists. Everybody tends to run to the farmer's market. The farmer's markets are definitely overrun, as well as there's a lot of farmer's markets that are not strictly producer only, meaning they allow people in that are reselling, buying from other people. And that makes for not such a hot farmer's market. So anyway, I coach people on how to kind of sift that, but there are so many opportunities that people haven't even touched on. Um, I was, when I took my foot off the pedal of high production, I was getting ready to make process with making connections with the cruise lines that dock within 45 minutes of my farm. You think they use a lot of flowers? Oh yeah. They use tons of flowers. Um, I was blessed for 15 years to sell flowers to Colonial Williamsburg. They're 10, 15, 20 minutes from me. They were a huge consumer of flowers. Um, and that I really learned about, I guess I'll call it, should we call it the entertainment venues? These places that maintain places cruise ships, Colonial Williamsburg. I mean, there, I know there's places all over the world that are like that. Um, that's just one of many. There are other opportunities. Um, and I think that we have a long way to go before we, there's too many growers. The point is you have to find your niche and you have to be set up professionally and approach it that way. Because I just, we have an endless want and, um, I see that just growing and it's changing now, um, which we're addressing our courses to that. I know that Jenny Love is uh, updating her course for people about how to do these new mini weddings, elope weddings, all these different venues and how to do them efficiently and profitable. Um, so I feel like people looking from the outside might think what you just said, that there's so many new growers. Well, they are, but are they selling flowers? You know, I mean, are they doing it? Are they building a business or are they, as I call it sometimes, um, are they tinkering? Because people, we have so many people just like me, a gardener that loved it and I just happened to find and it lit me on. And if I hadn't come, I come from a very, um, my whole family is full of a very, a lot of successful entrepreneurs. So I was kind of already had my foot in business and I ran a business for another person, the veterinary hospital. So I had a lot of ends to be able to kind of move forward a little quicker than people. I mean, if you're trying to start a business and flower farm, start flower farming, that is a lot. That's why you got to get help, in my opinion, to be successful. Why take 20 years to learn? Learn it in six months to a year and be doing it. 
Mm, absolutely. No, I completely agree. So I, that's a great tip, though. I feel like, you know, looking at things like uh, venues that are destinations like a cruise ship, like a Williamsburg, you know, in your area, those kinds of places. I know that, you know, there's a lot of push towards people not really going directly to wholesale, but trying to go too directly to the flower shop or directly to a CSA model or subscription model of some sort. I know there's pros and cons. I'm curious what you think, you know, if you're going to approach one thing or two things, that's like the main things that you really want to go towards. What, what do you think is the best? Sure. Well, there, I don't think anyone is the best. It's your lifestyle. And that's one of the things that we go through step by step in the course is like, okay, if you want to be a wedding florist, farmer florist, you do realize that 99% of that takes place on the weekend. You'll never, you'll never have a weekend off, you know? Um, and so my, my perspective was I spent 14 years going to farmer's markets back when I first started and I never had a Saturday off. So we took the, we said, okay, we are, <clears throat> I want to be a Monday through Friday, literally 6 a.m. till two or three o'clock in the afternoon farmer. And so that's what I started restructuring my business to um, and worked out really well. Um, but I tell you something I didn't mention a moment ago that I think is the future of flower farming in this, I mean, domestic flower farming, meaning local to wherever you are in the world, meaning selling flowers are these new, um, but it's where flower farmers either band together to create a wholesale market or, you know, I even tinkered and then my sister made me come to my senses. I would have loved to have funded and started a business that only sold to on wholesale local flowers. You know what I mean? It's to be a wholesaler of local flower farmers, flowers. And that allows flower farmers to farm and it allows somebody to sell the flowers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is really the future. But then on the other hand, I have a really good friend that does three huge farmers markets and they have an amazing business and they love it. So it's all about fitting your need. And that's in that with anything, a job or because if you're happy about it, but I think you can find a niche um, in your location and see, that's the other thing that sometimes makes you have to make a choice. Um, I had one gal um, who I actually was her mentor and still am. Um, the first thing she said to me, I live in the middle of nowhere. And I'm there, I, I'm growing all these awesome flowers, but have no idea how to sell them. And she is selling them like crazy now because she was determined and she found her niche and she did something that I recommended she didn't do. She actually sells um, bouquets on consignment in several different locations. I had a terrible experience with consignment, but she has proven that it can be done. So that's what we help people do. There's no one way. It's what you want to do, what you love, your passion, and then what's available. Well, one thing I was curious about, I'm sure you must get a gazillion questions about like with the pandemic and trying to reorganize the business, trying to figure out, you know, what have you been able to help coach people with, with regard to that, or maybe how to structure, um, how to adapt? Yeah. So funny. You should say that. So the week, what was that, like mid-March or something? Yeah, somewhere around there. The week that that happened, when that announcement came, um, several of my, you know, I was still, um, I mean, I, I, of course, I hang out with all these flower farming people, right? You know, instantly everybody's saying, oh my gosh, it gives me goosebumps even talking about it now. All my weddings are canceling. All my events are canceling. Right. You know, I mean, people were freaking out and I don't blame them. So I said, all right. I want to do a Facebook Live. Jenny Love, join me. Dave Dowling, join me. Jonathan and Megan Lease of Springforth Farm, join me. And it was me. I th oh, and Ellen Frost of Local Flowers in Baltimore. Kind of different angles from the markets. And I said, let's do a Facebook Live next week. And so this would have been like the end of March. And you want to know that by the time we actually had the Facebook Live, we had gone from swinging to everybody being, oh my gosh, my life is over, to just in two weeks, oh my gosh, there's so much demand in other ways that we can't even cut fast enough and deliver them fast enough. So it was really fascinating to me. Um, 
Jonathan and Megan, who only wholesale to florists, they're the ones that um, they have the no-till course. They only sell spring flowers. Right. And um, they went from no florist business to all of a sudden, they just went on social media and set up a platform and started selling bouquets and having drop off. They couldn't keep up. Jenny Love did the very same thing. Ellen Frost, the local um, sourcing florist, she did the same thing. She started doing bucket drop-offs instead of making arrangements because she had no staff so that she could help the flower farmers continue to sell their product. And Dave told us stories. He now, he was a flower farmer for 20 years, now works for a bulb supplier um, after he sold his farm. He talked about all these farmers canceling all their bulb orders and then all of a sudden having to (laughs) turn right around and, and, and reface. So we really helped each other to think out of the box. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm a wholesaler, but maybe I'm not now. I got a hoop house. That's what Jonathan said. I got a hoop house full of anemones and ranunculus. I have to sell. And they did it. I mean, it just made all of us so empowered and energized. And guess what? The local community all of a sudden found out that there were these local flower farmers. And now we've edu- we have more people interested in us now than ever before. I think it really brought us in front of people we would have never seen otherwise, especially florists. Right, right. Well, and I think, I think in a way, it really developed this awareness, like you said, of of just not only, I don't know, I guess we all saw like these pictures of all the flowers being dumped in Holland and all these different things. And then you realize this is, this was also going on in our own backyards in a way with California product and some of the other big domestic growers. And then, and then all of a sudden the people turn their eyes to their own backyard and realize, wow, we've got all these farmers that are, you know, conveniently right here and and the biggest problem i think was getting the product out and you know the people who made the transition to shipping or like you mentioned ellen with the buckets of flowers from the farms um and i know i was i talked with uh, a lady and i've mentioned this i think on the podcast before and in australia that was doing the same thing with these buckets you know you're buying these you just a bucket full of flowers that you could play with almost but i do also think just like it always happens right That those videos and them dumping those imported flowers was so sensationalized and it really fed us, the local people, because people were still unfortunately dying and needed funeral flowers. So the local florists needed some flowers, but we were able to step in and fill that need. And now guess what? They're like, whoa, these are awesome flowers. We can really use your stuff too, you know? Well, one thing that has become increasingly obvious to me as I've followed you and and what you do is, you know, you're bringing years and years of experience to your courses. And so are the other people that are part of it. I kind of wanted to take a minute and break down how you do your courses because uh, you know different people do things differently you know whether it's an all at once download or or what have you and i feel like the way you walk people through the different steps and how you give people time and it's over several weeks i kind of would you mind going into kind of that big picture Sure. So we offer, um, so I create my own online courses and then I also am a publisher of other people in our industry's courses, people that I actually invite um, to do courses. And so we sell two types of courses. We do on-demand courses, which are kind of shorter, four or five hours or less. Most of them are like an hour and a half. You can go to our website, thegardenersworkshop.com and buy them anytime. Once you purchase a course, it is always yours. However, um, I want to say, because you just um, mentioned that, you cannot download our online courses and most online courses because you cannot, we cannot protect our intellectual property that, but you have to log on anywhere you have internet, you log on to your online library and your courses are always right there. So you own them for life. Once you buy a course from us, you always have it. You can watch it as many times as you want. So we have some on-demand courses and then we, uh, what we've really started doing for flower based businesses um, is we have these 
schools, as we call them, and they're schools because they're um, dripped out over six weeks to you to not clobber you over the head all of a sudden with like 20 hours worth of videos. Um, it comes to you over six weeks and it lines up in your online library and you can watch them anytime. Each school course is a standalone course, meaning there's no order. You can take any course and it's totally inclusive. So what happens when you buy one of these online schools, um, they only have a registration typically once a year. And that is because really unique to our online courses is our instructors are very involved with our students. And um, we have a private platform that they have weekly Q and A's during school, during that six weeks where you get all your questions answered. And then we have the closed Facebook groups where all the students are with their instructor. And the instructor is in and out of there um, continually during school, but even after school, they still shepherd those people. They aren't in there every day, but they do drop in to answer questions. So we really feel like we really have a real connection between our students and our instructors. Our goal, my personal goal, and it's part of what I say to people when I'm interviewing them to become a, to create a course is, you know, you have to interact and we want that shepherding to continue beyond the course so people can really get help and feel like they can get their questions questions answered and so far we've done a great job of it and then after like so my course I've already had two years of classes so once if you took my class last year we have an alumni Facebook group that we then move everybody into because let me tell you what happens this incredibly unique community develops where people are helping and supporting one another, sharing ideas. And what happens for me, we have a lot of people in the group because of so many years of classes before I can even get to one of their questions to answer it, a student will answer it and say, I think this is what Lisa will say. <laughs> so it's like, it's just a, it's an amazing community and, but it has, you continue the difference between online courses and me traveling and doing 80 lectures a year, which is what I did for the past 20 years up until two years ago, was while I'm there at that lecture, I can answer some questions, but then your relationship with me was pretty much over. But I can answer your question on a platform with all the other students because everybody else gets to see it and benefit from it. So it's really phenomenal. So this fall, four of our schools, um, registration opens. The registration's only open for five days, and that is because we get everybody into school at the same time. And then they start getting their classes every week and we have the weekly Q and A. So it's not, people wonder sometimes, why is there just this little short window of registration? Well, we got to get everybody in, then get it lined up and then school starts. Um, and so flower farm in school, the basics, annual crops and marketing and more, which is mine is this fall. Jenny loves um, farmer florist, the wedding process. And she is really, um, done some great updates to address the new situations. Then Ellen Frost Florist School, growing your business with local flat sourcing flowers. And I think that is the future of flower shops. Um, Ellen has done a phenomenal thing. And then Steve and Gretel Adams, Flower Farm and School, growing cut flower crops in hoop and greenhouses. So we have a lot going on, um, but the classes run through the winter. So it's a great way. And then you have access to them forever. And um, my personal goal in doing all of this is to provide the people the professional help to really build their flower business. You know, maybe you don't want to be a flower farmer. That's what Ellen's story is. She thought she wanted to be a flower farmer and did it for like a week, I think, and realized er, this is not for me. But she wanted to have local flowers to run her flat her design studio with so we're i'm trying to give them all the tools that they need that's why we don't have a gigantic course we've broken it up into smaller more affordable pieces so people can take what they want but i will tell you that when people take one course they take them all you know what i mean it's like they just love the, the way of learning and how it builds their businesses they are we got some rocking flower farmers that are really doing it and doing it for a profit and overcoming all these challenges oh that's wonderful you know when you become a business as you know 
The minute you say, I want to do this as a business, the number one thing you have to do is get efficient. And what's getting it efficient? Learning from other successful professional people. And that's what we're offering. Yeah. I, I just feel like people don't realize, and I do, because I've, I've made a lot of those mistakes. We all uh, have. Right. But it's so much cheaper to learn from someone else in a method like this, then because not only do you waste the money or the resources, but in farming, you waste time sometimes and you either miss your window to start something or you have to wait another year to do something. And it can, you know, and so, you know, you losing revenue for a long period of time can be devastating. So um, I totally can appreciate the value of it all. I know when we spoken in the past um, and I wanted to ask, you know, since you've grown a successful business where you sold thousands of stems, I, I always think of the handful of flowers that are the go-to flowers that everybody really needs to look at. And I feel like you have some great stories. And I wanted to know, you know, what are flowers, what, what are maybe the top five that everybody should be growing or should really take a serious look at? Well, it really depends on what your market is. But I, so what I can tell you from my market, sure. my market is I wanted to sell flowers to the people that used flowers every day of their life, meaning florist and supermarkets. And then of course, retail customers. And so for us, the top five would be, believe it or not, sunflowers, zinnias, lisianthus, coxcomb, and celosia plumes. Those are such simple flowers, but they are our top five producers and cash crops and I can sell them to the same people week after week after week through very I mean well commercially they'll take the same color same flowers every week but our even our market customers that we could grow just that we grow a lot of minor crops and a lot of other things but those were our top five producers my motto is my course which if you would say which course should I take first it would be my course because it teaches people how to start a business and it talks about getting in with low investment. Everything that I just mentioned with to you, except for the Lysianthus, because we do purchase plugs, but you can start it from seed, but I don't recommend it. Those are all seed based crops. That is low investment, high return. Um, I mean, we planted 1200 sunflowers a week for 26 weeks, you know, that paid for a $30,000 John Deere tractor in one year, if you want to look at it that way, you know, wholesale in those sunflowers. And wow. you know, so it's not nearly as complicated, but I'll tell you what people do. They see all those beautiful bulb crops, ranunculus and anemones and tulips, and they go and invest. And the story that Dave Dowling tells reminded me when you just said about making that mistake, he tells the story about the person that called him that had planted like 5,000 tulips, but they're only about this tall. That's because they bought bedding tulips. They did, they weren't, they didn't know. They didn't know to grow ones for cut flowers. So they had 5,000 tulips to look at for three weeks, but they couldn't sell them. That's the kind of information that can just devastate you when you first start. That'll make, make or break you. If you make a lot of mistakes, some people just say, forget this. Wonderful business and flower farmers burn out because they don't, they're, they keep trying to figure it out theirself and using up all their energy. I know I've had fun watching you plant sunflowers almost every week. And, and I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of times people don't do sunflowers because of space or because it's a one cut, you know, stem, single cut stem or something like that. But um, to hear that you bought your tractor basically using sunflower money in one year, that's pretty impressive. You cannot get enough. Once you get your people hooked, they cannot get enough of them. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> So I know that recently you also did a, a, a live, so people who want to see the whole thing, they can go back and look at it on Facebook, but where you were comparing all these different varieties of sunflowers. And, oh, yeah. And we did a blog post about something similar to that, but not to the depth you did with just the pro cuts. And so... I see all these amazing colors that are coming out now. Um, how do you figure out maybe, uh, do I grow all traditional? Do I mix it up? How do I plan growing a red or a plum or something like that into the mix? Or do you just stick with the basics? Or how do you advise people with that? Sure. So again, well, first, not all sunflowers are created equal. 
That's a big one. And secondly, again, it depends on your market. For all those years of my high production, we only grew one sunflower in one color, Pro Cut Orange, because that was the most in demand. We produced 1,200 a week. Um, it was for our bouquet business, for supermarkets, as well as florists, and they bought them week after week. And it was just too complicated to do more than one color. It was just, and we proved that it worked and other people will tell you the same thing. But then as we started tweaking down and now we're selling to a much smaller pool of people, that is when I started branching out and, and introducing more colors and variation. Actually, my sister, the bouquet maker, insisted. She said, you know, I need some different colored sunflowers, you know, because now we're in such a small pool of people, they need some variety. And so that's when we introduced, I'm a pro cut fan because of how quick they are from seed to bloom, they're pollenless, stiff necks. But I will tell you all those fancy colors the whites, the plums, the bicolors, they, you pay a price for growing all of them. Their necks aren't as strong, but we figure out a way to use them because people love them. And so they aren't all created equally, but that's why I'm a pro cut fan. Um, I'm a, we have proven that sunflowers are profitable and you have to, I took me two years to get my florist off of wholesale shipped in sunflowers but once i got them oh let me tell you something you can they there's no comparison in the quality no there isn't there isn't now do you start them in the field or do you typically um start them in in blocks what do you start them in i do my weekly sowing of sunflowers and we always start them indoors it's what all commercial growers typically do it's just quicker faster and less work and we do it in plug trays. You can go to our Facebook page um, and go back and find one and, and watch me do that. Um, and typically they grow in that for two to three weeks and they're planted out in the field and it is quick and easy. People say, oh, why do you go to that trouble? It's like direct seeding and keeping the weeds down while you're waiting for that seed to sprout out in the garden. And then you got to keep, we got to keep the crows from eating them and the cardinals. Anyway, it's again, efficiency because I'm a professional. I don't have time to do all that stuff because we have a gazillion other things to take care of. And so this has worked out to be the best for us and home gardeners can even do that too. But yeah, that's our real secret sauce. Yeah. That was always a frustration on my part when we would direct sow something. It's like, how, why do the, the weed seeds seem to germinate and uh, surpass what I planted um, so quickly? And to be able to have that jump start and then, of course, you know, using fabric or do you use fabric or do you uh, use just mulch or what do you use for? You mean landscape fabric? Yes. Uh-huh. We use some landscape fabric in pathways. I do not grow anything in it. Um, those of us that live in the South that have the weed pressure for such a long growing season, the weeds, the grass or whatever you have growing jumps up on top of that landscape cloth and grows in a week of rain. You can almost lose 20 inches of landscape fabric. So you, we can't grow in landscape fabric, but we do use it in some applications and pathways. We use a biodegradable film called Bio360, which is on our website. It's made in Italy. It's made out of corn byproduct. We use that like plastic in some applications to help us suppress weeds. It's awesome stuff. We show you how to put it down by hand. We also put it down with the tractor. And then we do direct seeding into open beds, just meaning just soil, and we hoe. Um, and we have some great hoeing videos on our website. And um, we're going, I only direct seed in the fall, some of those cool flowers, and we're getting ready to go into that season. And you'll be seeing me hoeing in my garden here soon, but there are videos on our website showing how to do it. I hear people, I mean, I hear more belly aching on Facebook about direct seeding and the mess it is and how hard it is and they'll never do it again. It's because just like, I want to say you're like doing it all wrong. <laughs> I mean, I know I screwed it up for 10 years. Now we finally figured it out and we grow amazingly weed free, amazing crops with little input from us. Um, uh, your website uh, has all of this stuff on it, right? I mean, you even sell you even sell seed, don't you? Yeah, we're loaded. We um, So basically it all started, started flower farming, then I started teaching and then people wanted the stuff I use. So I launched an online garden store in 2005. We do not save seeds, but we buy the same, buy extra of the same seeds that we plant 
and we package them with our instructions, which is what's different about them. Um, and then we sell the tools and supplies that I use, like the hoe, only one hoe. You won't find a big selection on our website because we only sell what we use. Um, so yeah, so my books are there, all the tools, seeds, and supplies, and then all of our online courses. And there is a ton of free videos. Um, and my blog is there. That'll, that's, it's all there at thegardenersworkshop.com. And if they sign up for my newsletter, they're on the website. They won't miss anything. Awesome. That's great. Well, Lisa, this has been so good. So much information. I can't wait for people to get it. Um, thank you so much. And um, I look forward to your course. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been my pleasure to be here. And I look forward to um, chatting again sometime. Well, I hope that you got tons of great ideas from Lisa. She's a tremendous source of information, so I would encourage you to follow her on Facebook, especially because she shows up there regularly and is always so generous with her own insights into flower farming. Some great tips to take away from Lisa's interview this week. Number one, look into the world of cool flowers to help you extend your season. Number two, I love her attitude about the demand for flowers. She feels that there's an endless demand. It's all about finding your niche in your market. Number three, take advantage of the courses and learning that's available. You can learn in months what it's taken other people years to learn. Number four, there's not just one business model for you. Take a look at what will work best for you and shape your business around your life and your lifestyle. Number five, I appreciate Lisa sharing her top five flowers to grow. Sunflowers, zinnias, lisianthus, coxcomb celosia, and plume celosia. And don't forget, don't underestimate the power of the cut sunflower. I hope that you'll take a moment to explore the world that Lisa and her team have created at the Gardener's Workshop. It doesn't matter if you're a gardener enthusiast or an advanced flower producer. I believe that Lisa has something to offer anyone in the world of cut flower production. I also want to take another moment to encourage you to explore the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, otherwise known as ASCFG. If you're a flower farmer or you want to be, I can't think of a better group to join. They continually provide a network of hardworking people that continue to perfect the processes of growing cut flowers. Thank you for sharing your time with me and listening to another episode of The Flower Podcast. Okay, welcome back. If you'd like to listen to the full original episode over on The Flower Podcast, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And if you like what you're hearing here on The Field and Garden Podcast, we'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Jesse from The Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. <laughs>